Let me welcome you into our final week of this four-week teaching series that we have been uh, endeavoring to move through all through the month of December where we're considering this thought of Christmas, this idea of Emmanuel, that God is with us. Let me remind you one final weekend, and you probably don't need the reminder because you've been here, most of you have, for much of the month. If you, maybe you're new today, I'll sort of bring you up to speed But let me remind you of what our logic has been as we've been moving through these weeks together. We're doing a couple of things. Not only are we appropriately celebrating the birth of Jesus, which we ought to do every Christmas. We're we're saying, praise God, the Messiah came 2,000 years ago. But we're also preparing for the fact that the Bible said that he is going to come again. And doing this, we're considering the prophecies of the Old Testament, which were related to the Messiah's birth and were all fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. And we're saying, logically, that if Jesus fulfilled those Old Testament prophecies that he would come the first time, 
then we can know with assurance that he will in the same way fulfill the New Testament prophecies that tell us that he's coming again. You see, we're only getting half the story if we stand in 2014, look backwards and go, praise God, he came. We ought to also look forward and say, hey, I better be ready because, you know, the Bible says he's coming again. And so we've been working through some of the prophecies of the Old Testament that related to his first advent or his birth. So we began in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 where the Bible says that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son and you would call his name Emmanuel. A virgin would conceive. The Bible said the only way the Messiah could come into the world would be through a virgin womb. We know that the Bible says in Luke chapter 2 that Jesus was in fact born of the virgin Mary. She gave birth having conceived this child of the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament declared it would be so and in fact It was. Secondly, we then moved to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, where that verse says that Bethlehem would be the town where Jesus would be born. And this despite the fact that Mary and Joseph both lived in a village of Nazareth in the north of the land, fully 70 miles away. And 70 miles is a huge journey 2,000 years ago. And so it was in in Nazareth that the conception happened. It was in Nazareth where most of the pregnancy developed. And yet God moved kings and kingdoms to arrange circumstances so that when Mary came to full term and it was time for the baby to be born, where was she? She was in Bethlehem. Because God made it so in order to fulfill what the prophet said. The prophet said that he would be born in Bethlehem and in fact, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then last weekend, we considered the third prophecy, which was fulfilled in his birth. And that came out of Jeremiah chapter 31, where in verse number 15, the Bible says that the terrific event of the Messiah's birth would be accompanied by a horrific event, which would produce weeping in the mothers of Israel. In fact, Jeremiah 31, 15 says that the mothers of Israel were weeping for their children because they were, do you remember this word, this phrase? Because they were not. In other words, their children were and then they were not. They had been killed. And we know that that prophecy of Jeremiah 31 was in fact fulfilled in the awful event that we call the slaughter of the innocents where King Herod feeling threatened that a king of the Jews had been born, went and killed or had killed all of the children in Bethlehem in the region up to two years old and younger. Now it's this murderous plot of King Herod that leads to the fulfillment of the fourth prophecy that we want to consider today out of Hosea chapter number 11, and it has to do, this prophecy has to do with the country, the neighboring country to Israel, the country of Egypt. Now, we've had a wonderful time this month going to Bethlehem and Nazareth and going there by video and learning together so much about uh, those, those towns that are so pivotal in this Christmas story. Uh, we would love to have gone to Egypt, but we couldn't do that. And so the next best thing was to go along the road to Egypt. And so for just a couple of minutes, take a look at the video screens and let's go see the place where Mary and Joseph would have journeyed to Egypt. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. You know, I remember when Tracy and I were raising little children. You remember when your kids were really small, like a year old, maybe a year and a half or two years old? Traveling was pretty tough for us to do. We'd have to strap them in the car seat and take along snacks and stop every few hours along the way. And with all of the conveniences of the modern world, we still found it difficult. Now imagine Mary and Joseph with little baby Jesus, not the infant Jesus in the manger, but Jesus at a year, a year and a half, maybe as much as two years old. And suddenly they have to flee to Egypt in order to be safe from Herod's slaughter of the innocents 
up in Bethlehem. And how do they get to Egypt? They travel through the desert. Imagine 170, maybe a 200 mile journey from Bethlehem down into the desert valley, along through the valley toward Gaza, and then all the way south across the Sinai Desert into Egypt, into the Nile Valley. And there they would live until Herod died and the danger was over and they could return back to live in Nazareth. Now, why is this important? It's important because in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, the prophet speaks of God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. He says, when Israel was a child, my son, I loved him and I brought him forth out of Egypt. And in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew tells us that this bringing Israel out of Egypt, bringing the son of God out of Egypt, was in fact a prophecy that the Messiah would come from Egypt. Messiah in Jerusalem, we understand that. Messiah from Bethlehem, that makes sense. But Messiah from Egypt? Why would there be such a prophecy? Well, let's talk about it. All of you mothers who have traveled, well, dads as well, but every parent who has traveled with small children know that that's a bit of a challenge, right? Can you imagine? You can tell by the landscape behind me there. And we were between Bethlehem and, and Gaza down toward Egypt. If you can imagine that landscape, a 200-mile journey where you're traveling not by, you know, an air-conditioned car or a minivan with a pull-down, you know, DVD player, not, Jesus didn't have an iPad, you know, that he could play games on, no goldfish crackers to keep him fed along the way or, or Cheerios, dry Cheerios. You imagine making this journey with your uh, year-old, two-year-old child all through the desert. It would have been a difficult journey to say the least. And yet it was necessary, the Bible says, to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea. So I want you to look with me at Hosea chapter number 11. And let's just read one verse, the very first verse. Here's what the Bible says. God speaking, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. Now, more than once, God refers to the nation of Israel as his son. And when he says through Hosea in verse number one, when Israel was a child, he's not talking about Jesus. He is, in fact, talking about the nation of Israel. And in fact, the context of chapter number 11 makes it really clear that at least from Hosea's perspective, this statement about God loving his son and calling him out of Egypt, this is not a prophetic word. It's not a prophetic statement. It is rather a historical statement. Now, listen very carefully to this. From Hosea's perspective, he's not looking forward to the Messiah. He's simply rehearsing what had happened in the actual exodus when the Jews, under the leadership of Moses, came out of the land of Egypt and ultimately made their way to Israel. For Hosea, it's just a historical statement. But then when you come to Matthew chapter 2, and if you'll turn there now, you'll see this. When you come to Matthew chapter number 2, the Holy Spirit writing through Matthew clearly takes this historical statement of Hosea and applies it prophetically to this event of Jesus going to Egypt as a child and then coming out. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 2 beginning in verse number 13. Verse 13 says, and when they were departed, behold, an, a, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now, the they that departed are the magi, the wise men. When the wise men had departed, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt, and be there until uh, I bring you word. Well, until I bring you word of what? You, you might jot this in the note uh, margin of your Bible. Until I bring you word of Herod's death. That's the word. You are to go down to Egypt and stay there until Herod dies so that the child will be safe. He goes on in verse 13 to say, For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. 
So when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod. So that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Here it is, Hosea 11, 1, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now watch this. Hosea makes a historical declaration about God bringing his son out of Egypt. Matthew now says that is actually a prophetic statement. Or in other words, that Israel coming out of Egypt, the Jews coming out of Egypt in the Exodus, is in fact a prophetic metaphor, a prophetic picture of the fact that one day the Messiah himself would come out of Egypt. Verse 15 says, it fulfilled the word which was spoken by the prophet Hosea out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now if you'll skip to verse 19, the Bible says, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead, which sought the young child's life. Well, who sought the young child's life? Herod did. Herod has died. Verse 21. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go uh, into Judea or back to Bethlehem. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He should be called a Nazarene. So again, another fulfillment of prophecy in terms of where Jesus would grow up. By the way, it's very apparent when you read Matthew's gospel that it was even though Mary and Joseph were from Nazareth, and the conception happened in Nazareth, and the pregnancy developed in Nazareth, even though they were forced to go to Bethlehem by the tax and the census that Caesar had ordered, it was Joseph's plan, very clearly from Matthew, to live, to remain as residents of Bethlehem. He was going to raise his son in Bethlehem. That's very apparent that when the wise men come, they're still, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are still in Bethlehem. And then after they go to Egypt and they come back, where are they going according to this text? They're going back to Bethlehem. But because Archelaus is now ruling, that's Herod's son, he's afraid. The angel says, don't go to Bethlehem, go to Nazareth. Go back to your hometown of Nazareth and raise him there. And that in itself was a fulfillment of the prophets which said that he should be called a Nazarene. So what Matthew does, don't miss this, Matthew takes a historical statement of the prophet Hosea about Israel's exodus from Egypt and he connects it to the Savior's birth and short time in Nazareth, or I'm sorry, in Egypt, and says that coming out of Egypt by the Israelites is actually a prophetic declaration that one day the Messiah would come from there as well. Now, I want to help you understand this. So I want to walk through for just a few minutes a timeline of how all of this unfolded. So if you have your pen, let me encourage you to just jot down a few things about this timeline. I think it'll help you to understand it, okay? Here's the first thing to write down. We know about when Jesus was born. We can deduce this pretty easily from biblical narrative and from history, okay? That is to say that Jesus was born in 5 or 6 B.C., Sometime in the year 5 B.C. or maybe in 6, late 6 B.C. We know that. Now, some of you are thinking, well, wait, wait a minute. B.C. means before Christ. So how could Jesus be born six years before Christ? Well, don't get too concerned about that. That has nothing to do with the timing of Jesus' birth. It has everything to do with the development of the Gregorian calendar by the Catholic Church. And that didn't happen until the 16th century. And that's just the way the years worked out, okay? But we know that Jesus was born in about the year 6, 5 or 6 B.C. We also know that it was 12 to 18 months later that the Magi showed up in, in Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. So the wise men, can we say it one more time? The wise men were not at the manger the night Jesus was born. I know if you came to Christmas Eve service, they were in our beautiful display in the middle of the hallway, but they looked pretty and they came with the set, okay? They were not there the night that Jesus was born. It was 12 to 18 months likely before they got there. It was then when they arrived, 12 to 18 months after his birth, that Herod, 
hears that this king of the Jews has been born and determines that he's going to kill all the babies that might possibly be the king that had been born. And so in order to cover his bases, he goes beyond the 12 or 18 month period to the 24 month uh, parameter. And he says, any child two years old and under, I'm going to kill. And that's what happens beginning in verse number 16. And this is the reason that Joseph was instructed to take Jesus out of the area down to Egypt so that Jesus would be safe from this slaughter of the innocents. And he was to remain there, verse 13 says, until he got word that Herod had died. Now, we know a lot about the death of Herod. We really do. We have a lot of detail about Herod's death that was given by his own court historian as well as by the uh, Roman historian Flavius Josephus. In fact, there's so much detail about the death of Herod, about his symptoms prior to his death, that modern-day physicians have even attempted to make a diagnosis of his condition on the basis of his symptoms. That's how detailed they are in their descriptions. They tell us that in the last weeks of his life, Herod suffered with chronic itching, with shortness of breath, with severe intestinal pain, with convulsions, and a nasty case of gangrene. It's a nice way to go, isn't it? What a horrible sort of end to this horrible life that Herod had. In fact, I just thought it was interesting that the historians were so detailed in their description of the way that Herod died, they even took the t time to note that in the last days of his life, his breath was intolerable. What a horrible thing to say about a dying man. But they give us great detail about his death. They also tell us, and this is what's important, they tell us exactly when Herod died where he died and we know where he was buried, okay? So you might write it down. He died in April of the year 4 BC. In April of the year 4 BC, he died in his palace at Jericho and he was buried at Herodium, which was his palace at uh, just near Bethlehem. So he dies in April of the year 4 BC and then you come to verse number 19 where the Bible says, and when he died in April of 4 BC, then the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, I want you to go back up to, uh, to uh, Israel. Now, you put all of that together, and what it tells us is that likely, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph only remained in Egypt for a very short period. Likely only a few months that they were in Egypt. And then they made their way back up to Israel. Now, you may be asking a question at this point, and honestly, I wouldn't blame you for asking. It would be a pretty good question at this point. Uh, this morning, you may be asking, you know, all that's interesting about the death of Herod. I'm glad to you know, know that he had bad breath when he died. But what, what does this have to do with Jesus and Egypt and the Messiah coming out of Egypt? It's a good question. So, so, so let me answer it for you, okay? Here's, here's what you have to remember. That Matthew's emphasis in his gospel is to present Jesus to us as the king of the Jews. I said this to you a couple of weeks ago. All the gospel writers present Jesus to us with a different perspective. And Matthew's focus is to remind us and let us know that Jesus is the king of the Jews, the Messiah. This is the reason in Matthew chapter number one, he begins his letter, his gospel by saying, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, the son of Abraham. First thing out of the gates. He says, this baby born in Bethlehem named Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of David. He is the king of the Jews. And then as you read through his gospel, he constantly is emphasizing the connection that Jesus as Messiah has to the, uh, the nation of the Jews, the Israelites. He's constantly connecting them. And he does this by repeatedly drawing parallels for us. Let me give you a few examples of what Matthew does. In the first place, we know that the Old Testament tells us that the Jews went to Egypt to escape death. Isn't that right? They went there to find food and to, and, and to, uh, to survive the famine. There was food in Egypt. So they went there to escape death. In the same way, Matthew says, Jesus, their Messiah, went to Egypt to escape death. The Old Testament tells us that the Jews came out of Egypt in an act of great and miraculous redemption. And Matthew tells us that Jesus came out of Egypt in order to bring a miraculous and great act 
of redemption. The Old Testament tells us that the Jews spent 40 years in the wilderness. Matthew is very quick in his gospel to tell us that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. Again, parallels. The experience of the Israelites with the experience of their king. The Old Testament tells us that the Jews received miraculous feeding when the manna fell in heaven. And Matthew tells us that Jesus miraculously fed his people, fed the multitudes in a desert place by multiplying a little boy's lunch. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that the Jews got the law of God from a mountain, Mount Sinai. And in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Matthew tells us that Jesus delivered the law of the kingdom from a mountain, the Sermon on the Mount. I could go on and on, but I'm simply saying to you, do you see the connection? What, what Matthew does to remind us that Jesus is the king of the Jews is that he is constantly connecting what happened in Jesus' life to the experience of the Jewish people as their king. Now, this is why, this is the, the reason why Matthew, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, takes this, this flight of Jesus to Egypt and his coming out of Egypt, and he connects it to the historical event of the Jews coming out of Egypt in the Exodus. And here's what he says. He says that when the Jews were brought up out of Egypt by the power of God, that event was a declaration that one day their Messiah in the same way would come out of Egypt in order to bring redemption. He's simply making the point that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who came out of Egypt like they came out of Egypt. Now for us, what that means is, is that there are wonderful lessons for us to learn about the redemption that Christ offers us by studying the prophetic picture of it, which Matthew makes the connection to, this exodus of the Old Testament. If y'all still with me, say amen. All right. So take your Bibles for the remainder of our time together and leave Matthew and go with me to the Old Testament book of Exodus. And if you're new to your Bible, it's the second book in your Bible. So Genesis and then Exodus. And go to chapter 12. Exodus chapter number 12. And we're going to begin in verse number one. Genesis 12, verse one, a very familiar passage that that many of you will be familiar with um, of this event just before they leave Egypt. Verse number one says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying to them, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take unto them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So every household, every family is to to secure from their flock a lamb. Verse 4, If the household is too little for the lamb, then let him and his neighbor next unto him his house take according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall you make your count for the lamb. So in other words, if, if families need to go together, neighbors need to go together, they can do that. But there's got to be a lamb for every house. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. And you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. The 10th day, choose the lamb. Keep it separate from the other lambs for four days. And on the 14th day of the month, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill that lamb in the evening. Every family is to make a sacrifice of a lamb at the same moment on the same day, that 14th day of the month. Verse 7. And they shall take the blood of that lamb and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses wherein they eat it. So once the lamb is sacrificed, they're to catch the blood of that lamb and then literally to paint the doorpost with it. So the two side jams and the lintel all around that door of the house, they're gonna, they're gonna put that blood on the door. Verse number eight, they shall eat the flesh of the lamb in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Do not eat it raw or sodden with water, but roast it with fire. Verse 10, you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. But that which remains until the morning, you shall burn with fire. You don't need to put it in the fridge. There's no leftovers. You're not going to need it. Consume it all that night. Verse 11. And thus shall you eat it. 
with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Take your pen, underline that statement, verse 11. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and I will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You should underline that statement. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. It's the reason this is called Passover. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, if you know the rest of the story in chapter number 12, you know that it's following these events of God's judgment on this night when he comes through and the firstborn in every household is killed by God's judgment except for those who have painted the blood of the sacrificial lamb upon their door, that that tenth plague of God's judgment is the final straw which then causes Pharaoh to let the people go. And in chapter number 13, you have Moses' um, declaration or his commandment to the Jewish people as they're leaving the land as it relates to remembering this particular night. Verse 3, chapter 13, verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. By his mighty hand, he brought you out. There shall no leavened bread be eaten, as you can remember or commemorate this day. This day you came out in the month of Abib or Aviv. You came out of Egypt in the month of Aviv. Out in the margin of your Bible next to verse number four, write the word spring, S-P-R-I-N-G, spring. Aviv is not really a month. It's not a month on the Jewish calendar. It's connected to, related to April, but it's really more about the spring of the year. They came out in Aviv. It was in the spring of the year, and they came out of Egypt the morning after the very first Passover. And from that day forward, they were commanded every year on that day to commemorate that event called the Passover. Now, let me, let me tell you something that, that I, I find really interesting. I don't know if this will bless you like it blesses me, but I think it ought to give you some encouragement about how God never misses anything on his clock or his calendar. Do you remember that I told you a few minutes ago that we know that King Herod died in April of the year 4 BC? We know that he died a few days before Passover in the year 4 BC. We also know from Matthew chapter two, verse number 19, that right after Herod died, then the angel went to Joseph, who was down in Egypt, and said to him, Herod is dead, now you leave Egypt and go back up to Israel. So when would Mary and Joseph and baby or young child Jesus have left Egypt, made their own exodus, and gone back up to Israel? They would have done it right after Passover, 1,500 years after the original Passover and the original Exodus had happened. Can you imagine? Have you ever thought about where Mary and Joseph would have gone into Egypt? They didn't have a Motel 6 to stay at. So where would they have gone? Well, there were, there were many Jewish communities in Egypt, so they likely stayed with maybe some extended family, but they stayed in a Jewish home, just, just uh, without question. And so what would they have been doing when Mary and Joseph and Jesus were in Egypt in this Jewish home on Passover? They're celebrating Passover, this this high holy day, this great feast of the Jewish people. And it would have been so on Joseph's mind, knowing that Jesus was the Messiah, that here they sit in Egypt taking Passover, and that one day God's gonna lead them back up on their own exodus go up to Israel. And they go to bed that night, and there's a knock on Joseph's heart from the angel, and he says, hey, hey, Herod is dead. Pack your bags and head back. And Joseph and Mary had to be thinking, you gotta, you gotta be kidding me. It's 1,500 years after the original exodus, the day after Passover, and here we are. We just had our Passover meal, and God is saying, now you get out of Egypt and get back up there because the Redeemer has come now to come out of Egypt. I don't know if that blesses you, but I love that, that God doesn't miss anything. Amen? 
right on time. So what is it that we can learn about the redemption of the Messiah having come out of Egypt by looking at this ancient story of the original Exodus. Several things to write down and we're gonna be done. Here's the first one. Understand what, what God wants us to know is that Christ came to lead us out of bondage. Christ came to lead us out of bondage. And I really think that this is the reason that it's so significant that Jesus would have made this quick journey as a young child down to, ne- to uh, Egypt and then back up to Israel. I think what God wants us to see is this. In the same way that Moses led the children of Israel out of bondage into a life of freedom, Christ came so that we might be led out of bondage and into a life of freedom. Now you understand, I think, that the Jewish people went into Egypt to find safety and they began their life in Egypt in a very blessed place. Remember Joseph, the son of of Jacob, was ruling in Egypt, and so he gave them the best land. So when the Jews began to live their their young life as a nation in Egypt, it was a good thing. They were living in the most fertile uh, parts of the Nile Valley. They were living in the land of Goshen. It was all wonderful. They had freedom. They had, life was good. But then Joseph died, and another Pharaoh came to power. And what had began as freedom and fun and excitement and joy and blessing slowly became tyranny and enslavement, and bondage, and bitter suffering. And every person in this room has experienced, if you've grown to adulthood, you've experienced this same thing. That we grow up in life thinking, when I become an adult, when I get to live my own life, when I get to do my own thing, life is gonna be so good. And it is, isn't it? Did you ever say this when you were growing up, your parents were making you do something, and you were like, You'd say, I can't wait till I grow up. Did you ever say that? When I grow up, I'm going to do what I want to do. The day I turn 18, I'm out of here. I'm going to be my own boss and be my own man. I have to tell you, this has nothing to do with the message, but bear with me for a minute. I thought about it. My wife, Tracy, is the most frugal person you've ever known in your life. She just won't throw stuff away. She won't waste anything. And, uh, and so all of my adult life, or all of my married life, when I've asked her for a piece of gum... I've never in my married life received a whole piece of gum from her. Because she thinks you don't, nobody needs a whole piece of gum. So she tears it in half. And I have said to her, when I grow up, I'm going to chew a whole piece of gum. So she put the whole pack in my mouth. But that's, that's you know, we have that spirit when we're growing up. Like when I grow up, it's going to be so good. It, and, and it is, and we begin to live our lives and make our choices, and, and we're in that young place of life, and it's exciting and thrilling. And here's what we discover, that those choices and, and blessings that we have as adults, if we don't know Christ, they lead us slowly but surely into a life of bondage and tyranny. Because we begin to live a life where, where life that seems so good and hopeful and blessed in the beginning over the process of years without Jesus over the process of years, gets really tied to addictions and sufferings and, and hurts and, and we get all tied up in, in uh, the lusts of this world and the cares of this world and the, and the pain of, of this world and we get bound up in bondage and tyranny. We are like the Jews in Egypt, crying out in our bondage. And so in the same way that God sent Moses to deliver the Jews out of bondage, Jesus went with his family to Egypt so that God could show to us the Messiah has come and he comes out of Egypt so that every one of us who know him can move from bondage and tyranny and addiction into a life of freedom in Christ. Jesus came to break the bondage of sin in your life. Know this. It's what Galatians 5.1 says. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Why are you bound up, if you know Jesus, why are you bound up in sin? Why are you bound up in addiction? Why are you bound up in guilt? Why are you bound up in sorrow? Why are you bound up in in, uh, revenge and hatred and anger? Christ came to set you free. And this is what he wants us to know. That our Savior went to Egypt and he came forth. Chapter 13, verse 3 says, It is by the mighty hand, the strong hand of God that he brought you out of bondage. Loved ones, 
be free because Christ came to set you free. And if you say, well, I know Jesus as my savior, but you are in ever deepening bonds and chains, then something's wrong in the mix. And you need to find the freedom that Christ offers. Here's the second thing to know. It is that he wants us to understand that this freedom that he came to bring us is only found by faith in the Lamb of God alone. Freedom is found by faith in the Lamb of God alone. This is the whole point of God's Passover plan. It's the entire point. He says in verse number 12 of chapter 12, I'm coming through the land of Egypt and I'm going to smite the firstborn in every house. Now, by the way, nobody, there wasn't a Jew in the bunch that doubted that God would do what he said. Because this is the 10th of 10 plagues, right? They've already seen God keep his word nine times before with the plagues. They saw the Nile, the mighty Nile, turn to blood. They saw the frogs come jumping into town. They saw the flies swarming in and they saw the cattle diseased and they saw the darkness over the land and and they saw the hailstones from heaven with fire. They saw God's power. So when God said, I'm coming through the land and I'm gonna judge Egypt in this way, I'm gonna smite every firstborn in every house. They knew God would keep his word. And so God said to the Jews, now before I come through, I'm gonna make a provision for you. So every one of you get a lamb. Get a lamb, get a spotless lamb, and on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, all of you at the same time, you sacrifice that lamb, and when you do, you take the blood and you paint it upon the doorposts. And then when I come through and I see the blood, I won't, I won't bring my judgment to that house. Now, go with me for a minute. If y'all are with me, say amen. You think there might have been some worried five-year-old boys in some houses that night? You think there were some 12 and 15-year-old boys who were the firstborn of their siblings, and they're going... Is this going to work, Dad? You can imagine, can't you, as the, as the Lord is moving through and judgment is coming and, and these, these people are dying and wails and weeping, some people running through the streets. So it's just chaotic now as the judgment spreads throughout Egypt. And those kids must have been thinking, Daddy, did you, did you get the blood on there good? Did you paint it good? Is he going to see it? And don't you know there were some fathers in that night that were hugging their sons close, tears on their cheeks, going, we're trusting God. We're trusting God. He said the lamb's blood was enough for you to find freedom from this bondage and live through the night, and we're trusting in the blood. And this is why Jesus went to Egypt and came back, so that all of us would know that the freedom from the tyranny of sin that he offers us is through one thing and one thing only. It is the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for us that we could be saved. This is what He wants us to know that if you want freedom, stop turning over new leaves. And if you want freedom, stop trying to be better. If you want freedom, know this, that the Lamb of God died for you and his blood sets you free from the bondage of sin. And then the final thing I want you to know, Jesus went down to Egypt so that he could come out of Egypt just like the Israelites had so that in the same way that the Israelites were set free from Egypt, we could be set free. So that the same way that a lamb came out of Egypt, covering them with his blood, Christ came out of Egypt to cover us with his blood. The third thing is that we should understand in this passage that freedom in Christ leads us to fellowship with God. Freedom in Christ leads us to fellowship with God. Now while you're writing that down, if you are, let me ask you a question. If, I, if we were sitting having coffee just talking and I said to you, what, what's the purpose of the Exodus? Why did God bring the Jews out of Egypt? You, you might answer that question in a lot of ways. You, know, you might say, well, because he was their people or they were his people or because they were crying out to him or that he wanted them to be happy or he wanted them to be free or you know, he's nice, whatever. Here's the real answer. Turn one page back. To Exodus chapter 10, verse number three. Exodus chapter 10, verse three. Look at the last statement of verse. God speaking through Moses and Aaron. God says, let my people go that they may serve me. Everybody look up here and do not miss this. Let my people go that they may serve me. You know what God wants you to know about this exodus, this idea of Jesus going to Egypt and coming back so that you and I can do exactly what the Jews were commanded to do. That is by finding 
freedom through faith in the blood of the Lamb that we can be ushered into a life where we walk in fellowship with God. Jesus did not come to die on the cross to save you so that he could be a nice addendum on your life that you basically ignore Monday through Saturday, visit him for an hour on Sunday, but could care less what he says to you in the, in the interim. He did not come to do that. He came to deliver you from the tyranny of sin so that you could serve him. Now you gotta ask the question, what does that look like? How, what does that mean to serve him? Well, it means a lot, but here's some basics. What was the first thing God did when he brought them out of Egypt, the Jews out of Egypt? Very first thing he did. He gave them his law. He said, you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. And this is the way we're going to relate. You're going to treat each other this way. You're going to live in your culture this way. And you're going to relate to me this way. The, The law of God is all about how they relate to each other, how they relate in their world, and how they relate to God. He gave them his word. Loved ones, Christ saved you by his blood, if you know Jesus, and gave you freedom from the tyranny of sin so that this book would direct your relationship with God. And if you say, I know Christ, but you have no life directed by this book, then I would challenge you to do some serious consideration of your conversion. Because I would submit that the life that's free in Christ is a life that lives in the freedom of this book. The second thing that he did is he took them into the land. He took them into the promised land, the land full of the milk and honey, the land of Canaan, which was the land of blessing and victory and and, uh, where they overcame. And I would submit to you that this is what he's called us to. That we live according to his word and we live in the land of victory and fellowship and submission to him because the blood of the lamb has been shed so that we could be free. And so what have we learned this month? We've learned that the Bible said that a virgin would conceive, and she did. And we've learned that she would deliver in Bethlehem, and she did. And we've learned that when she delivered and the Messiah was actually born, there would be great weeping, and there was. And we learned that the Son of God, the Messiah, would go down to Egypt because the prophet said he would and come out, and he did. And he did all of those things so that we could find through his sacrifice life and freedom and fellowship with God. Now, all of this to say that if he kept those promises to come the first time, then we can be sure, can't we, that he will keep his promise to come again. So are you prepared for Christ's return? Is Jesus your savior? And if he is, are you living according to this book and in fellowship with him?